Hi, and welcome to Inside Indy. I'm your host, Kelly Vaughn. Uh, today we're going to talk about stroke. We've just uh, left the month of May, uh, which is Stroke Awareness Month, but it's mm -hmm. never too late to talk about it, and we want to make you aware of um, mm -hmm. Do you call it a disease? This is Dr. Karen Rodman, who is a <laughs> neurologist here in Indianapolis, and we appreciate you coming on. Um, do we call it a disease, or is it an episode? I would call it a disease because it's cerebral vascular accident, or a CVA, and a stroke is a medical condition. It can be the third leading cause of death within the United States and one of the first leading causes of chronic disability. Wow. as well. So yes, I'd call it a disease. When you say chronic disability, so what happens to people? We're, we'll talk about the causes okay. and symptoms, but and we want to get to the heart of it because we want to scare a few people into listening to what you're saying <laughs> this right. evening. Okay. So when you talk about those disabilities, what happens to a person? What What's the range there of what can happen? Well, the range of stroke symptoms can be varied. Um, the ones that people commonly are talk or heard about or know about are the inability to get your words out. Like you literally cannot speak or you can only say a mm -hmm. few words um, and that's called aphasia. And then the other end is dysarthria where your speech, the words are appropriate but they're very, very slurred. Um, I think the, the thing where you talk about disability is when people get severe paralysis of a face, arm, or leg on one side of the body, right side or left side, and that's mm. called hemiplegia or hemiparesis. Paresis means partial paralysis, plegia means you can't move at all. Mm. That and can happen. I've yes. never, I've not run into somebody or know somebody that's yes, happened to. Yes, it can. Usually and the one side. Yes. Um, and of course, obviously you want to heal from it, but you know, if the stroke is big enough, unfortunately, sometimes you can be left with residual severe speech difficulties, paralysis involving, besides speech, face, arm, or leg. Sometimes if it's in a part of the brain, like the frontal or temporal lobe, sometimes you can be left with cognitive issues, meaning memory issues or planning issues. So those are some of the disabilities mm. that can be left, again, in people who've had larger or more major strokes. Some strokes can be milder or moderate, meaning you have the symptoms, but over maybe a period of a week or a couple of months, you can make an excellent or full recovery. So those are the varied presentations, the most common ones. Very, very rarely, if unfortunately a stroke is in a deeper part of the brain called the brainstem, you can actually be paralyzed in both arms and both legs. Oh. Um, of course, occasionally vision can become blurry in one or both eyes. Um, or you can lose half of, of vision in, let's say, in the right half of your visual field. They call that a, a visual field deficit, right side, left side, or it can be blindness or vision loss in one or both eyes. So wow. those are other symptoms. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happens when a person has a stroke? Because, I, you know, we think about these things that right. can happen. What is, what is it doing to our brains to cause these things? Well... I mean, there are several mechanisms. The most common one, and I think the one most people think of, is the ischemic stroke, whereby, for various reasons, enough, unfortunately not enough, oxygenated blood gets to a certain area in mm -hmm. the brain. It can be one or multiple areas. And when that happens, you get tissue injury or tissue death in the brain, so mm -hmm. that if it happens in the right frontal lobe where you don't get enough oxygenated blood to a certain area in the right frontal lobe, your left side might be weak, your speech might be slurred. The other is, and you've, we mentioned this, is the intracerebral bleed where vessels within the brain, one or it can be multiple, unfortunately rupture, and you can get a bleed in the brain or what they call intracerebral bleed. And that can be you know, from a stroke or sometimes unfortunately from head trauma, um, subdural mm -hmm. hematomas. Occasionally people who are on blood thinners who aren't monitored can get spontaneous bleeds. Oh. Um, and the other mechanism can be emboli from the heart which can go from the heart to the brain, occlude vessels, and again, you don't get circulation to certain areas in the brain, and you have a stroke. And then I would say one of the last mechanisms is what we call the inflammation or vasculitis, where maybe some people who've had Lyme disease or syphilis um, can get inflammation or vasculitis within arteries in the brain itself and can have strokes. So those oh. are some of the mechanisms. Okay, mm -hmm. and bring a stroke on. Yes. So how, how are we getting there? What are we doing wrong to, for this to happen? Well, first of all, you always need to identify risk factors and treat them appropriately. Okay. Hypertension, heart disease, like heart attack, congestive heart failure, 
atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal heart rhythm that can lead to stroke, um, obesity, poor diet, lack of physical activity, abuse of drugs such as cocaine, methamphetamine, marijuana, diabetes, high cholesterol, wow. and of course, you can't control this family history. Um, mm. Obviously, if you have any of those risk factors, such as let's say high blood pressure, you always treat it medically with medication, prescription medication, as well as the appropriate diet, exercise, maybe nutrients that you're taking, mm -hmm. but you always treat it medically. Diabetes, sometimes you can be a diet controlled diabetic, but other times you may need one of the diet, shall we say diabetic pills like Genuvia, Glucotrol, Glucophage, with or without insulin. Okay. Sometimes cholesterol mm. can be diet controlled, other times you need one of the statin drugs, Zocor or Lipitor. Okay, wow. Mm -hmm. So now I have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what, what do you advise to someone like me? Because again, we go along in our daily lives, everything's right. okay, and then one day we don't expect, we think we're doing the right things and mm -hmm. we don't expect this to happen. Absolutely. Well, for you, Ms. Vaughn, you have high blood pressure, obviously your medical doctor will treat it appropriately. Sometimes one medicine controls it. Some people need two or more medications. Okay. The appropriate diet control is very important. If you need to lose a certain amount of weight, you know, you do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you need to follow with your family doctor with your blood pressure on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Because okay. sometimes you can be on a medicine and you're doing well, but sometimes your blood pressure decides it's going to go up and stay up, so you might need Periodically, your blood pressure medication adjusted, either changed, added to what you're on, those mm -hmm. sort of things. The impact of exercise, how does that play into all of this? I think exercise, sensible exercise, plays into a lot because if you do the appropriate exercise, get to the appropriate weight, that certainly will improve pre-existing conditions such as hyperlipidemia or elevated cholesterol, diabetes, or even high blood pressure, so it does improve it. Hmm. Okay. You know, um, and obviously once a stroke does occur, we do have medications, the antiplatelet medications such as aspirin or Plavix mm. or Agronox or some of the more potent blood thinners like Xarelto, Coumadin, Eliquis. Okay. So. I see those all on television. Yes, I mean, <laughs> you do. Absolutely. And I never remember the names and you got them down. I'm so, <laughs> I thank you for reminding us of all the, yes. the, the different options. Um, you talked about heredity. Now, my, my, great, my grandmother okay. actually uh, had a stroke, I think mm -hmm. at the age of 38, in the early 19, probably 40s it was. Okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. and my mother always blamed it on, she, back then, you know, you had 12 kids. She had six, but <laughs> the other six didn't make it. Oh, a lot I'm of sorry. them sorry. Yeah, but you know, it's the, 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 she, they just felt like it was too much. And of course, not taking care of herself. And then I remember mm -hmm. people saying that she would walk down the street and one side would drag her leg. Right. So that was the partial yes, paralysis. It, yes, it's the, now if it was just one leg, they would call that paresis of a leg. If it involved her arm and leg, they would call that hemiparesis. Mm, and okay. you know, again, this was the 1940s. You didn't have CAT scans or MRIs to say exactly where the stroke was. But you know, there's even at the age of 38, your a grandmother could have had very poorly controlled high blood pressure mm, or I'm diabetes sure. and or high cholesterol. And the more risk factors she may have had, the more, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, her chances of having the stroke were. Mm. Mm -hmm. So is there a test that we can take to see if we are <laughs> at risk for a stroke? Or well, that maybe, because I'm thinking if it's mm -hmm. an artery that can okay. find faulty arteries? Yes, there is a screening test called a carotid Doppler or carotid ultrasound, and we use those terms interchangeably. The right and left carotid arteries supply the frontal, main frontal portion of the brain. Wow. And if they have a significant, I'll say 70 to 99% blockage, you can screen for that. And if it is found, they would then do a follow-up test called a CT angiogram or CTA of the neck or an MRA, MR angiogram of the neck arteries to verify that, and that can be surgically treated. The other thing that we have, besides doing the CTA of the head and the MRA of the head and neck, they look at not just the carotids, because only the carotid Doppler can look at the carotids, they can look at the vertebral arteries that feed the back of the brain where strokes can occur, and they can look at arteries within the brain, anterior, middle, posterior cerebral arteries, basal arteries, which if clots or obstructions occur there can also cause strokes. Wow. So these are tests that can be used to screen for strokes. Um, the carotid Doppler is one of the main, and it's inexpensive, relatively. Really? It can okay. be done as an in and an out patient. 
uh, basis mm. um, at any hospital or certain areas or certain companies like CDI that do MRIs or ultrasounds. And it what can do be you call there. it again? Because most of us, okay, I'm going to go get that test, but I don't remember Carotid what you said. Carotid ultrasound. Carotid. C-A-R-O-T-I-D ultrasound or carotid Doppler. Those are the, those, that's the term. Okay. And we okay. can ask our family doctor and they can order that yes, for us? Yes, they can. And they can be done as an outpatient. Mm -hmm. Clearly, always follow up on your high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, um, you know, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Always, always. Now, when someone does have a stroke, we will sometimes do more specialized blood tests to look for abnormal clotting factors that could predispose you to clotting and strokes. It's called a hypercoagulable panel. You know, in some people, we might have to do a syphilis titer, mm -hmm. Lyme for Lyme disease, because they can lead to stroke syndromes. Wow, wow, scary. It's kind it of is. scary, but it I is. feel good that you're informing us because we, mm -hmm. we really need to know. Um, mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to us um, those of us who have mm -hmm. weight issues, maybe we don't exercise enough, um, <laughs> or, and especially we have somebody in our family who okay. we feel, oh, especially somebody who's a smoker, I would think. Is that and a please discontinue cigarette smoking, discontinue the abuse of methamphetamines and cocaine and marijuana. I know there is medical marijuana for specific conditions, certain childhood epilepsies mm -hmm. and maybe certain nausea, syndromes and cancer patients, that's strictly medical marijuana. But when you abuse marijuana and cocaine and others, it can cause an inflammation or vasculitis in the brain, which can lead to strokes. So you, you want to keep that in mind. And thank you for mentioning cigarette smoking, because mm -hmm. that is a huge one. And yeah. because it's not just toxic to the lungs, it's toxic to the blood vessels in the heart, the brain, and even circulation in the legs. Yeah. If you have any type of congestive heart failure or heart disease, get periodic ultrasounds of the heart called an echocardiogram to look for any clots or abnormally formed or heart valves that could lead to emboli to the brain or strokes. Or if you have abnormal heart rhythms like atrial fibrillation, when you see the doctor get the EKG, which can pick that up. Okay. So. Okay. Yes. Well, we appreciate you coming on and enlightening us, inspiring us to do better. Absolutely, uh, we can all do better. I'm a hypertensive, and I take my blood pressure medicine. Oh right. So Amen. I, to I don't that. give advice. I try to take it. <laughs> all right, all right. She lives as she preaches. So um, we have on the screen heart.org. People can always get information yes. from the American Heart Association about heart disease and uh, stroke. Stroke. As well. Absolutely. So, okay. Well, Dr. Karen Rodman, neurologist here in Indianapolis. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank. Thank you, Ms. Kelly Vaughn. On Inside Lady Indian. Lady extraordinaire for oh. having me on your show. Oh, thank you so much, <laughs> Karen. And uh, we'll be back with more here on Inside Indy, but do take note of what Dr. Rodman says, and, and we'll have to have her back soon. We'll see you here in just a minute. And welcome back to Inside Indy. I'm Kelly Vaughn, and uh, we're going to talk to a pastor here in Indianapolis who takes the word directly into our prisons. And um, we're going to find out what that's like and the impact he's having on those who are um, serving time. Uh, and joining us is Pastor William Bumpfus. Yes. Uh, and it's Jesus Inside Prison Ministry. Correct. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Man, you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, about 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> yeah. Why? Well, uh, I was called to do it. Uh, God saved me in prison. And uh, while I was there at prison, he spoke to me and told me to go out and build him a prison ministry. Wow. And I've been doing it now for the last 40 years. Wow. Yeah. When God speaks to you like that, is that audible or is it in your heart? How, how yeah, well, happen? mine was dramatic. Uh, uh, I was at Michigan City, in interstate prison, Michigan City. I was on the third floor. These are cell houses, and I was on the third floor. And I had just came in from morning, my morning job, and I was waiting for everybody else to go to work. And I laid down across the bed, uh, and the ceiling opened up just like with Peter. And I saw a vision with my eyes open of me traveling all over the world. And on the third floor, 
Jesus stood at, cell, at my cell door and said, go out and build me a prison ministry. And wow. left. Yeah. Wow. And I was Just, shocked for days. Really? Right, right. So and, you obeyed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how, how long, when were you going to be released to go out and... and well, and, I was serving a four-year sentence. Okay. And uh, uh, right, after, right after that, uh, well, I had wrote my judge and make a long story short, after 10 months on that four years, uh, I was released wow. on uh, four years probation, which was unheard of because I was a criminal. I was a career criminal. Okay. Yeah. So it's like Paul singing in the right. Chains. Exactly. Yeah. They just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you mind us asking what you were serving time for? Burglary. Okay. Burglary and theft. So what, and was that here in Indianapolis? And, and what was, led to that? Well, Tell us about your life prior to that. Right. Well, um, I was actually arrested 23 times. Okay. Uh, and I served time four times. That was my fourth time. Oh. Uh, three times for the state, once for the feds. Okay. Uh, at the age of uh, 17, on my first uh, uh, going to prison, I went to prison first time at 17. Uh, and uh, in that prison, I was introduced to heroin. Now, I was always using drugs, you know, marijuana and drinking, but I was introduced to heroin. When I left that prison, mm -hmm. I, I had a ha habit. And so uh, that began uh, 13 years of okay. uh, heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. I shot heroin, cocaine, and morphine wow. uh, every day. And uh, then in 1978, mm -hmm. in my jail cell, facing 60 years for the burglary, uh, some inmates told me about Jesus. And they told me that if I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart, I wouldn't get 60 years, which is what they wanted to give me. And uh, I prayed, asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I didn't get 60 years. I got four years, which mm -hmm. means you only do two. And uh, went to Michigan City at that time as a Christian. And 10 months later, God set me free. Wow. Yeah. What a powerful testimony. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I've been doing it for the last 40 years. Oh, yeah. Man. Now, let me ask you this, because it's related to what's going on in our society today. Sure. How did you overcome the heroin addiction? Well, uh, I teach our men all the time in prison. Uh -huh. uh, we don't have a drug problem. We have a sin problem. Mm. And once the sin was gone, the drugs was gone. I ain't never mm. craved drugs, alcohol, or anything since the day I got saved. Wow. Right. <laughs> there you go. There's the, yeah. there's the solution right. to your open That's, crisis right, right there. You right. heard from Pastor Bumpus. So, yeah. so tell us about this ministry. So you, you, you get out and you obey. I obey. And, and you did what? Well, I obeyed and uh, it took a while because I was on four years worth of probation on the street. Uh, and I didn't know nothing about prison ministry or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, it took me a while. Well, I first I got out and did what the word said. I immediately started going to church. Mm -hmm. uh, met my wife in church. Got married. And, uh, you know, that was just trying to get in doors, no doors open. Uh, then finally, uh, a, a prison, prison began to open a force outside the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and we began to go to those prisons. Uh, and it was a while before they opened up here in the state. A lot of chaplains told me that the reason why they didn't let me in was because of my career as a criminal and all the, ex -con all the convicts I knew. And according to them, I was playing some kind of religious game. Mm -hmm. So the chaplains didn't want to take no chance on letting me in. Uh -huh. uh, but after I going to prisons all over the country for about four or five years, uh, then they began to open up the prison for me and I began to go in prisons here. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, it, so I guess when it comes to doing ministry in prison, you just can't walk in. Obviously, it sounds no, like you have No, you can't to... walk in. No. Wow. No, wow. it's a process. Yeah, you have to go through orientation uh, now. Every, every volunteer has to go through training, which is called orientation. They have to do that every year. They have to go through a background check. Uh, so it ain't just like call the chaplain and go inside prison. Uh, Those days are over. Okay. Yeah. So tell us what you do when you go in. When I go inside prison, mostly uh, I have evangelistic style services in a lot of prisons. Mm -hmm. In fact, well, I'll go in into the chapel uh, and have service, uh, preach the word, give altar call. Uh, then I give them literature, my books and others so they can write. And we do follow up like that. Uh, there's other prisons, like in Kentucky, where we do prison invasions. We go in there like on a Saturday all day, uh -huh. Sunday all day, on the yard, in the hole. We invade the whole prison, preach on the yard, uh, you know, in the cell blocks uh -huh. and all that. And on Sunday, we culminate with a baptismal service. Wow. So we do those three or four times a year inside prisons in Kentucky. 
Wow, we call okay. those prison invasions. As opposed to a service that they come to voluntarily. Correct. This is you actually go in, it's a little more radical in terms right. of Right. Just like uh, the, the first of this month, June, I'll be doing a tent revival at a prison here at Heritage Trail. Started last year. Mm -hmm. It was overwhelming success. They only allowed 130 some men to come, but it was so many men wanted to come. They said anybody can come this year. So we, it, it houses 1,800 men. Wow. So we're going to do a three day revival there under the tent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So your goal in going into the prisons, and obviously you're there to save right. souls. Correct. Is it anything beyond that? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, you know, get them born again, you know, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of reentry programs and everything, and they, they all work with, with education and all that kind of stuff. But the major component, which they don't deal, do, is residence. You know, I mean, how's a guy mm -hmm. going to go to get his GED and got no place to stay? So the average guy coming out of prison don't have no place to live. So we have a program, which a uh, house, residential program called Jesus House, okay. where we can house up to 46 men at one time. Wow. Uh, and then they come there, they come there immediately out of prison, uh, and then they can stay there until they get on their feet. Wow. Yeah. So now what happens when they come there? I assume they're reaching out to you for all kinds of input? Well, we have a, input? well, the best way to explain it once they come there uh -huh. is it's a strong discipleship program. Oh. Uh, we have three services, five days a week. Okay. Uh, and then Saturday is their free day, and then we have service on Sunday. They're allowed to go out and look for jobs, but, you know, they got to meet those uh, meetings uh, three times a day if they ain't got no job. So what is the biggest adjustment you see that inmates make uh, in terms of um, getting back into the mainstream of society? Right. And I guess it would depend on how long you've been there, right? Correct, right. Yeah, yeah I've had, I got guys that's been locked up 39 straight years. 25 straight years, 30 straight years. Uh, and uh, if, they didn't have, if they didn't have a place to go, then they are released to the mission. Uh, yeah, so I'm talking about. Uh, and it's, it's just all trauma, which is the reason why uh, they state 79% uh, uh, of everybody getting out of prison goes back within the next three years with a new charge. And of that 79%, 50 of them commit a crime the first week they're out. Now, and that's why? Because... And why? It's because... Where am I going to live? You know, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? You know, they've been locked up. They've been away from society four or five, six years. Uh, most family might be and died or, you know, all that kind of so stuff. If you don't have family support. Right. If you don't have waiting. family support, wow. a good network for them to come home to, they're going to real fan. Wow. Yeah. When you were younger and you kept going back, was it the same thing? It was the same thing. Yeah. You know, every guy that goes to prison says the same thing. I ain't coming back. And they really mean that. Mm -hmm. So you get out, you go to the same neighborhood that, where all your friends is, and, if, and before the day's over, you're doing the same thing you was doing to get you in there. You're using mm -hmm. drugs or you're using alcohol, and you're right back in that same circle. Mm -hmm. You have to break out of that circle. Right. And the only way you can break out of that circle, you got to have somebody that's in another circle to take you out of that circle. And that's in life in general. That's I mean, life in general, correct. <laughs> a lot of times people wonder why, yeah. like, you know, certain groups or whatever, yeah. have, you know, classes have certain correct. opportunities. But yeah. if you're not exposed to that, and I don't right. care who you are, what color you are, correct. that you, you could miss out because Without of the lack of, lack of exposure. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, how can people who are watching support what you're doing with well, Jesus Inside Prison Ministry? Well, the best way they can go on my website. Uh, and uh, all our information is on there, videos and everything that we do, and they can donate through our website. Okay. Now, are they mm -hmm. donating money, items? Well, we take uh, money, literature, like uh, Bibles, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Christian books. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to someone watching um, who might be interested in helping someone who's coming out of right. prison and they do need that, right. that support, that network right. of support. They need to connect with a local prison ministry because oh, you okay. don't know who you're dealing with when they're coming out of prison. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to, the best way is, is connect with a local prison ministry or a church and do whatever you're doing through that church or through that prison ministry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So yeah. what do you love most about you, what you do? I just love doing it. I guess that's my life before I got uh -huh. saved. And uh, now it's my life now that with Christ is 100% better. Okay. Um, and I know we're just about out of time. Can yeah. you share with us very quickly a, a story of 
well, they're telling me I got 30 seconds. Just okay. <laughs> somebody whose life changed. As well, a like I said, the guy that, doing 30, that did 39 years, he'd been with us now five years, first time he ever had a job. He'd been working out for the last three years, got a brand new car, and he's now a volunteer that goes inside prison with us. All right. Totally adjusted. All right. Well, we appreciate what you do, and we'd like to have you back. Maybe Gladly. bring somebody with you who's, Gladly. who's gone the same journey. So, uh, yes. Pastor William Bumpfus of Jesus Inside Prison Ministry, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank on you. Inside Indy, and thank you for joining us. I'm Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.